You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That funky tune means it's time for the funkiest show here on the old network, our final program of our broadcast week. Yes, it's time for TWIFO this week in Futures Options. As the name implies, this is the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network where we break down the broad spectrum of hot options activity across the commodity and futures options side of the fence. So whatever's lighting it up that week, we're going to hit on it. Probably crude, maybe some gold, maybe some S&Ps, maybe some eggs. You never know what's going to make it in. Fluid milk, lean hogs, you got to tune in to find out what's hot this week. And of course, as always, this program brought to you by our friends over there at Quick Strike, as well as our friends over there at CME Group. And you can always follow along with the show, not just live in the chat room every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central via Mixler. So if you grab that link before, it's the same link every week. So just bookmark it, save it, or follow us on Mixler. Then a lot of you guys do. You'll be notified the instant we go live with this program. You can also follow along over there on cmegroup.com slash twifo. 
stands for This Week in Futures Options, of course. And I do believe Mr. Nick, just give me a thumbs up sign if it is live. All right, we're getting a thumbs up here in the studio, listeners. So I know he's been teasing for you the last couple of weeks. Previously, you could listen live and generate your own reports, but the links on those TWIFO reports were not clickable. But as of now, during showtime, this is a good little carrot, a good little incentive for you folks out there to join us live in the Mixler chat because they're going to be live during showtime. For, so for that one hour from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Central or 2.30 to 3.30 Eastern, those links will be live. So you can follow along with Nick and I. You can always follow along with the report, but now you can click, as we do, looking into things like the quick skew or into things like exactly in the most active category, what exactly was the most active options activity in a particular month out here in crude. So you can break it all down for you. It's a good, good incentive uh, to join us live here if you can because it's, it's fun stuff. And, of course, you listen after the fact. We love you guys, too, and you can always get access to the reports as well. This won't have that live clickable link feature. And, of course, uh, you can always listen to our stuff via the website, theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, via the mobile app, iOS, Android, and the beloved Fire OS. However you listen, live, after the fact, whatever you, however you get your TWIFO programming, make sure you hit us up with your questions, your comments. We do love to hear from you guys. And joining me on the old program today, doing dual duty, holding down his own seat, as well as the CME hot seat. He is my cohort, my partner in crime for all things commodity options action. Mr. Nick Howard, the founder of Quick Strike. Mr. Nick, welcome back to the TWIFO program, sir. All right, glad to be back. Glad to finally deliver on the promise for the hot links. We have been today. teasing the people for quite some time. Right, so you got to get, uh, if anybody's out there and can verify that uh, the links, I verified the links are working, but if we want to give us a thumbs up from out there, let us know. I will have our, uh, our social media team check and verify, sir, as we get on with the program. Let's kick things off. I got one more? All right, go ahead. We do have nice little studio audiences. It's fun. Fun to have a live studio audience as well in the program, It too. is very crowded. Makes things, yeah, it is crowded. It makes things feel even more, uh, more cozy here in the Options Insider Studios. Yeah, and today we're going to, uh, uh, the, for the first time, we're able to tweet directly from QuickStrike right out to the QuickStrike Twitter account. So all the stuff that we're talking about, even if you're not able to log in to the cmegroup.com slash Twio or Twifo uh, link, we'll push them out on Twitter, and those will be links that you can then open up, and you'll see the screens that we're talking about as we're talking about that. There you go. So if you're not following us at Options, first off, you're, you should be because you're listening to this program. And secondly, if you're not following Nick, he's at Quick Strike one That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1 over there on Twitter and indeed on the old stock thing, stock thing, stock twits. Let's kick things off, Nick, uh, as we are wont to do a lot these days. I know it still is top of mind for a lot of you guys out there. That is all things crew. It's been an interesting product to watch of late nick you know we've had a lot of up and down we had the will they won't they dance on that 50 line right around that 50 handle excuse me again this week uh closing at 50 or somewhat shy of that depending on where you're looking there on the term structure so slightly down to unched on the week not a huge move in the future certainly not compared uh to recent weeks and of course as we're uh, settling in around this 50 strike again we're seeing some of that elevated vol from last week coming in again off about a point and a half uh, pretty much across the board out there. So I think a good, I think the technical term for that, Nick, is a shellacking uh, of volatility. <laughs> of course, we saw a broad crushing of vol pretty much across the entire marketplace from equities uh, to everything. It's been just the week to sell volatility, it seems like. So oil, not surprisingly, following suit out there as well. You can, I'll let you dive into the quick skew in a little bit. Listeners, if you're following along on the TWIFO page, then you too can click on those quick skew numbers and to see not just where it is now, but how it stacks up historically. You'll see that little link it says click to view quick skew history. Click on that and then you too can play the home game here of TWIFO. And of course, the number one with the bullet again this week, front month. Front month still where the action is out here. We're talking June uh, with about a little over half of the paper, about 52% of overall volume coming in that front month yet again. I think we have a question later about the, or maybe a comment about the weeklies. So we'll get into that probably a little. This is the, the question that won't go away, Nick, here about the, about the WTI weeklies. Uh, but number one with the bullet, if you were wondering what was the hot option, the hot strike out here 
in crude again this week. Yet again, it was the double calls. This strike simply refuses to die. It persists every week. Even last week when there was a sell-off, we saw double calls lighting it up. And this week, now that we're kind of on just slightly down, double calls yet again in the front month lighting it up. And quite a bit to the tune of about 64,000 contracts of this week, including 21,000 yesterday, 22,000 on Wednesday, a sprinkling only about 5,000 on Tuesday, and roughly 10,000 on Monday. And the good chunk of that, most of that opening throughout the week as well. So very, very active paper out here on the double call strike. And then we fall off a fair bit uh, for the number two strike here, which would be the 50 calls. That's a strike probably more of you would have expected to be uh, leading the charge this week. Again, that's the that's the hot strike. That's the will they, won't they level that everyone keeps talking about out here in crude. And yet 50 strike uh, substantially less here than the doubles, only about 29, just a little bit under, a tick under 30,000 contracts uh, with the lion's share of those going up actually on Monday, about 7,000 going up on Monday. And then following hot on the heels yet again with uh, the double calls. They can't get away from this double strike here, Nick. This time out here, though, uh, one month beyond, so into the July of the, uh, tw- these are the double calls here, 28,000 total uh, going up this week, 28,123, including nearly 16,000 yesterday. So a very active, just the double strike across the board, Nick. They can't, they can't seem to stop trading these. It doesn't matter where WTI is. doesn't matter what's going on with the vol or anything else. They can't seem to be drawn away from the, uh, the doubles. But that's not it for, if you're talking you know, the weird trade of the week, maybe the head scratcher, uh, you don't have to look too far. You just look to uh, WTI in particular. We're looking out here in the D's, not even D's of 2018, D's of 2017. We got some longer-term bulls uh, rearing their heads again this week out here. It was the Dece 80s lighting it up to the tune of 4,000 on Monday, 4,000 again on Tuesday, and about 2,000 the rest of the week, a total of a little over 10,000 of these Dece 80s, the lion's share of that opening. Uh, so a lot of upside interest, shall we say here, uh, Mr. Nick. We'll have to dig in a little bit to see if those were harvesting some premium. Probably not. I can't imagine there's a lot of juice on the Dece 80s. It sounds like that was an opening buy, uh, in which case that would be kind of reinforcing what we've been saying for a while. Some bulls flocking out here. Mr. Nick, a lot to parse here in WTI this week. We're talking quick skew, we're talking vol, as well as uh, your thoughts on some of those longer terms, some of the other trades you saw lighting it up in WTI this week, sir. Well, you know, we've been talking about it for many weeks now, how, uh, WTI is trading in this range, right? So we're still within this range. We're 47 to 55. And I think uh, what we can see from this uh, recent decline here in the futures is that it it tried to go lower, really couldn't go lower. Uh, So I think that people are, every break that we've gotten, I think we noticed it last week as well, any break that we got, people were buying the calls where we just were prior to that, right? So I think we saw a lot of doubles trade last week uh, in both the June and the July. I think you're seeing the same thing again here. So we had a break. We couldn't really we couldn't really push through. In fact, we had a couple. We had a 2% then a 4% in the same day, right? You know, like we talk about that first 2% doesn't work, and then you got to get to that 4%. So we saw some vol, some vol bidding in there uh, throughout the week, but there was no follow through. And, and I think that's why you continue to see the upside. I think the bias is toward the upside um, just based on how the trade is going and you know, and if you go out there and look at the June and the July and you look at the 47, our 47 put is really our next big open interest. So like we talk about all the time, that big OI number is is generally going to be looked at as a, a possible support level. You know, it's, I think it might even be a little bit of 48, mostly 47, then 45 again. So if we do see any more downside, I think we see an uh, increase in volatility, but I don't think we're going to see a big push down to, you know, numbers much lower than, you know, uh, if we got to 45, I'd be surprised. And again, not knowing that much about the market other than what watching the market and, and watching the open interest and watching the volatility, you know, that would be my expectation. I think that we're going to see us hang around here again. People are going to, you know, the surprising thing about the double calls this week is that, you know, we're inside of three weeks to expiration now, right? So you got, you're going to have to have a, a, a like a 17% move higher in order to get to the double calls to make them valuable. But, you know, if you get a, enough of a bump right away, you'll get some pop in those and, uh, and, and maybe get some premium out of them. But I, I was watching, you know, one of the, one of the uh, things you have to really watch about when you're looking at the vol term structure in general, or, or especially the front contract, you see that volatility always kind of pops up, pops up. But what you got to make sure you go out there and do, and you can go look at some of the free tools out on cmgroup.com, you got to check and see what the theta is on that front month contract. So the vol was up quite a bit 
uh, intraday on a lot of these things, but the reality is it was really like half of it was just theta. Um, you know, the vol was recovering for what the theta was. So the price was firm, but, you know, the volatility is not really up. It's just kind of making up to keep that. You'll see a lot of times throughout, throughout the week or as stuff progresses, you'll see the same price trading, and that's going to be theta getting picked up by the volatility. So, you know, that's just sort of, and there was a question we could talk about a little bit later. Um, Okay. There's a question we could talk about a little bit later. Somebody said, what's so the concern about the low volatility in the new market? We could talk about that. We, we can address that when we get a chance. But as far as, uh, you know, the, our, we haven't talked about a crazy trade. We won't call it crazy, but the 80 calls, right? That's the, Those are way out crazy, there. Crazy, weird, weird, head scratching, right. interesting maybe right. trade. Uh, For sure. There were t I, 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 I'll try to go back and look, but I think those are probably block trades. Um, there were 4,000 on Monday and 4,000 on Tuesday. So more than likely those are blocks or... Um, just when you see those round number lots and they're larger lots, you typically are expecting them to show up on the block. But uh, again, people, you got to believe that the bias or the expectation is still on the upside. So I think that's what we're seeing um, from from that standpoint uh, on the trade. As far as the quick skew goes, um, I don't think there's, you know, if you're looking at the numbers now, and again, we're going to explain these further because that's another question that we received this week. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the puts the puts got less expensive and the calls got less cheap, right? So that's why those you got a declining number in the put with the capital P. Those were those were expensive, but now they're less expensive, and you see a declining number with a small C on the call side. That means they were cheap, but they're less cheap now. So a little bit of shift in the in the in the way the vol curve is structured, and uh, and again that would probably play into the fact that we're kind of grinding into the lower strikes. You're going to sell that downside, especially if you don't think anything's going to happen. And then you're going to pick up maybe some of the, like we just talked about, maybe some of the upside, those double calls, and, uh, and try to get, you know, take advantage of the lower volatility levels and pick up some premium on the upside. Yeah, you know, it has been uh, an interesting week to watch uh, crude Perhaps not as, as rock'em sock'em as it has been in recent weeks. We do have some questions about crude in a little bit. So we'll, we shall return to crude, don't you worry, uh, listeners. I put out a quick flash poll ahead of the show here, Nick, to ask people what were they, what were they feeling for a breakdown. And a lot of votes actually coming in for soybeans. So they're in luck because we have a listener question about that in a little bit as well. So maybe we will have to talk some soybeans in a little bit. Before we get to that, Nick, a lot of people also wanting, chomping at the bit for us to talk a little bit of the shiny stuff, a.k.a. gold, uh, selling off a bit again this week, off about 20 handles on the week. So flirting right around that 1270, 1280 line, depending on, again, where you're looking out there in the future. So an aggressive sell-off. People have been wondering kind of when will this uh, upside uh, dance come to an end, at least for this week. It seems to have, uh, have mitigated somewhat out here in gold land. I know all the gold bugs won't like to hear that. We can get to that in the skew in a little bit as well. And of course, like we said earlier, all the bid in the skew was really in the calls in the last week or so. We jokingly referred to one of our programs, I believed, as a, uh, a double black diamond in terms of slope, in terms of the call skew. It was so aggressive, so steep. So when we're moving away from those, we're going to see the vol come in quite a bit. That's pretty much what we saw out here. Off anywhere from uh, about a point and a quarter all the way up to two, two and a half points on um, the vol as you get closer to that front month out there. So Bit of a vol crushing, a vol drubbing. Uh, we'll see if people start buying up these puts if we continue to sell off, and maybe we'll see a reverse of that trend. But right now, moving away from that extremely rich call wing means the vol is coming in. And, of course, the calls were still active this week. If you were wondering what was the number one gold strike with a bullet this week, it was the uh, front month yet again out there in June, the June 1300s uh, lighting it up. June, of course, accounting for about actually almost two-thirds of the paper out here in gold this week. But no doubt lion's share of it due to this one pretty sizable active uh, strike out here, the 1300s lighting it up. A total of 12,000 contracts this week, the lion's share coming on Monday with about 5,000 of those going up on Monday and then scattered paper throughout the rest of the week. Some of that, a good chunk of that closing though. So could have been some people perhaps uh, Deciding discretion was a better part of valor there, Mr. Nick, and trying to live to fight another day. Closing out their 1,300 positions, waiting for a more opportune, shall we say, scenario to, to open those up again. Number two out here, a fairly distant number two with roughly half the paper, are the 12 half puts again in the front month, doing about 65, 100 contracts. Again, fairly even paper throughout the week on that one as well, except for today. A fairly light paper out there on that strike today. And then we drop off a little bit again to the 13 halves, the ever optimistic a 13 halves. People were loading up. Remember we said last time on the show, listen, people were loading up on some far out of the money strikes this week. 
uh, perhaps deciding again uh, to close out some of these. Uh, we saw about 5,600 going up, nearly 4,000 on Monday, a good chunk of those actually closing on Monday. So it seems like some of the more optimistic of the gold bugs this week, perhaps again, deciding to try to live to fight another day. I don't know how much juice was left on those calls when they closed them out, but hopefully some, and then some scattered paper throughout the rest of the week. Looking a little bit longer term, as we like to do out here in gold as well, there was some interesting paper uh, coming up in, again, Dece. Dece 2017 is where the longer term head scratch in paper is going up this week, uh, Mr. Nick, uh, it, which was the 1700s out here in December, uh, going up a total of 2,200 times, including looks like a block of about 1,500, Nick, going up on Thursday, 1,000 of that roughly uh, opening. So again, uh, that 1,700 strike seems a wee bit, uh, a wee bit optimistic, certainly by the end of the year. Uh, but then again, uh, you never know with some of these gold bugs. We've seen some of the weirder trades we've seen on this show, Nick, since we've been doing it have been in the call skew in gold. So nothing really surprises me out here at this point, uh, but still a little bit. I think you can turn that charitably as optimistic. I don't know, Nick. What are you feeling about those 1,700 calls as well as what we saw out here in the quick skew in gold and anything else that caught your eye in gold options activity this week, sir? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned those. I mean, that's that's kind of the 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 most uh, out there trade as far as the, the strike extremity goes. But I uh, wanted to make sure that people realize that if you are following along and you, you see that 1700 call in the, in the December contract, you can click on it and it'll open up a, a, a window for you. And in that window, you'll be able to see the volume by day. And Mark mentioned that there was a block that went up and you could tell that it's a block by looking at the, looking at the legend on the chart to see uh, what the bar represents. So see a purple bar, it'll be, it'll be a block trade. Uh, as far as everything else that, uh, you know, that I noticed out there and the gold, we saw um, at least in, let's say, June, July, August, even September, we'll, we'll, we'll say the first four months, and that's where the majority of the open interest is. You see some, again, you see uh, particular months in all of these commodities where they're, they're out there on the curve, and then they have sort of a jump in open interest. Those become um, uh, contracts of interest, like you'll see it always generally in the June and the December in crude, and here you'll see it in, uh, you know, the... Uh, the, the October and the December in the gold. But if we look at those first four months and you take a look at the quick skew number, you're going to see, especially, you know, June, June uh, contract has 27 days to expiration right now. And you'll see that the calls got much less expensive and the puts got much, uh, much, you know, much richer. So they were very cheap and they got less cheap now. So you'll notice again, those numbers went down. Again, the small P represents uh, the small characters represents cheapness, and the, the capital letters represent expensive. So something can get more, you know, more expensive or less cheap. Or whatever. that's usually how I'm referencing it. But if you go down across the board, you're going to see we saw a little bit of a tightening uh, of that um, of that quick skew ratio. And what I'm going to do is I'll go out here and push out. Uh, as soon as I get a chance, I'll push out that quick skew. But you can look for yourself if you go out there and click on the link and you'll be able to pull up the quick skew and you'll see how uh, over the week we saw a tightening in that 30 day uh, quick skew number for the 25 Delta calls. OK, now. Um, let's see, is it out there that's working? Yes, you guys can go out there and take a look and you'll see the graph pop up and you'll, you'll notice for yourself. And we'll, we'll push that out a little bit later uh, as a tweet from the show. Um, but as far as that, right, we, we're seeing sort of the same thing here in gold like we have been all along, right? We get a little bit of a run up, right? And then we come back down and we're sort of, again, within, we're in the probably the high third of this range that we've seen, this 1200 to the 1300 range. We, we didn't get much past 1290 this week and we had a big drop off right off the bat uh, on the open on Monday. So we came from 1290 down to 1280. We never saw above that. So over the weekend, uh, there was... Um, there was that drop, and it could have had something to do with the election, too, probably, out in, out in France. So there was, once it was sort of uh, in the books, um, uh, people were less concerned about French it. French love know. their yeah, gold, yeah. sir. <laughs> and, well, a little, little less worry, right? So everything sort of came exactly. back in line. So uh, other than that, I think we're going to see this, again, speculating only, right, not knowing anything in particular, just watching the markets. We're going to see a trend here uh, that we usually um, – that we usually see here when we when we when we when we have our commodities that are just sort of moving along, and and again, uh, one thing that uh, of notice here in the gold is that if we look at the 30-day vol, um, we're we're at around five-year lows, right? So we're really, and that's the 30-day consumer maturity volatility, right? Volatility. So that means we're taking 
two contracts that are around the 30-day volatility if we don't have one. So it's very similar to right now to the June contract, but we're on lows for that volatility. And again, volatility is low. It could always go lower. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not a sale. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a buy, but it's just that, you know, the market is, there's not much expectation there. And when you start to see uh, um, the, the skew, meaning the calls and the puts start to come in line here, which we're really seeing basically when we have a 10 vol, a 10 and a half volatility and a, a skew that's only two and a half percent rich, right? So you're really looking at like a 13 vol in the calls and like a nine or eight and a half vol in the puts. So we're seeing a pretty, a pretty slopeless, well, there's, slo there's some slope there, but a pretty flat vol curve as well between a pretty wide range of strikes. Speaking of wide range, we asked you guys at the top of the show a little flash poll. Hey, what do you what products are are floating your boat this week? We gave you some of the usual spectrum of the golds and the crudes, as well as of course some others, including soybeans. And Mr. Nick, soybeans is uh, is winning right now with about fifty seven percent. So the people have spoken. We all think we also have a listener question on this as well. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to read that question now ahead of the listener question segment. Hopefully you can handle that, Mr. Nick. Mexing up, sorry, the Mexican, mixing up the format a little bit. We've got a question here from... Mexican uh, soybeans. Yes, Mexican soybean. Lillipod wants to know, what's up with soybeans? Good collar territory again. Obviously a long-term listener of the show, Nick, because uh, they're referring to our discussions from last year when on uh, this program as well as on our former LSFO program over there with CME about how, how juicy it was from a collar perspective. You could buy... Fairly uh, tight protection, sell very rich calls, and do that uh, on a long futures position, and it was it was pretty attractive. Uh, so let's pull up the soybeans. The people have spoken. They want to hear about some beans. Again, you guys can follow along, cmegroup.com slash twifo, and of course, the links are live. So you can, you can read this live just like Nick and I are doing right now. We're doing it off the cuff, uh, on-the-fly analysis, as you come to expect here on the fine TWIFO program. The beans selling off a little bit this week, again, depending on where you're looking out there in the futures, off roughly 5 to some of them, the farther portion of the curve, a little bit more, maybe around 7%. Uh, so a bit of a sell-off out here in beans land this week, even though vol uh, kind of mixed across the board, which is interesting. Usually you get a little bit of a move out there in the beans. You might see a little bit more uh, from the vol this week, not so much. I'll let Mr. Nick break down the quick skew in a minute. If you're looking where the action was, it was pretty uh, pretty even breakdown uh, between uh, the front month out there, the June, and then the July, which was about 32% for the June and about 30, almost 37 uh, for the July. So a wee bit more out there in July. And that's where we find our number one trade out here uh, with the bullet. And then the ags tend to trade on a little bit different rules of engagement. Listeners, they tend to move around their crop rotation cycles. And so that's kind of what we're seeing, I think, here again today. Number one with the bullet are indeed the July pars, the 1,000 calls uh, with about 13,600 lighting it up this week, uh, including about 4,000 on Tuesday, nearly 4,000 on Monday. So aggressive paper early in the week and about 2,000 each uh, for the rest of the week. So again, a pretty active week here. A good chunk of that opening as well out here in the third, excuse me, the 1,000s here for good old soybeans. And then we fall off a little bit uh, to actually going out here to, again, talking about that crop rotation cycle to, what was this, Nove, the Nove 1100 calls uh, taking the number two spot with 11,000 and change out here. Pretty much all of that closing, including about 4,000 on Tuesday, 2,400 on Monday, and about the same number on Wednesday. So, uh, and again, almost 11, a little over 11,000 actually out here. Again, the lion's share of that closing. So maybe a little bit of crop rotation going on in the options as well, Nick, as they're uh, at least closing out here on the old uh, Nove and maybe getting a little more active towards the front portion of the curve. And of course, uh, the front month was not forgotten either. We saw the 980s out here in June lighting it up to the tune of just a, just a tick under 10,000, 9,800 and change to be precise here, including about 3,400 almost on Thursday, that being the, the biggest day out here in the old beans here with about 3,400. Again, total of almost 10,000. So a nice smattering of paper here, Nick. We don't usually see this in a lot of our other products. Usually most of the paper is aggregated in pretty much one month like it is usually in the front month with WTI or maybe front month typically again uh, with gold as well with some scatterings to the longer term. That's one thing nice about the ags is that it does tend to disperse and distribute the liquidity a little bit more evenly across the old term structure, at least in some of those months that are more relevant for the planting and harvest cycle. So it's been a while since we've talked about soybeans. What's catching your eye out there in skew land? And as uh, getting back to our listener question here from Lillipod, uh, what's up with the beans? Is it is it indeed good collar territory again, sir? Maybe he or she looking to put on a few 
beans collars here. Well, I went back and uh, you cannot see as far back as I can with uh, if by clicking on the 30 day quick skew uh, for all the different contracts out there. But yes, it, it has gotten the skew has widened quite a bit. So you, you, you can see that from the numbers where the calls have gotten larger uh, and more expensive and the puts have gotten uh, less expensive. So it's not as good as it was last summer when we had all that problem down in Brazil with the rain and that kind of thing. But we are kind of approaching that same time frame. Right. And another thing that it's obvious that we that we can reiterate is that, you know, it's, it's seasonal. Right. So that there tends to be a, a similar trade as or people tend to believe that there's similar trade throughout the throughout the weather patterns that occur in the summertime. And so if if it's if we get what we got last uh, summer, then we're not quite as extreme in the richness of the calls and the cheapness of the puts that we saw because we did see uh, some very different levels. And we put those trades on, right? We put those on, we did the collar, and then we synthetically hedged it with the, uh, with the at the money, um, with, the, with the short at the money. And, um, and those performed fairly well uh, as, that volatil as the volatilities normalized against each other. It was so one of the more reliable setups, and it persisted for at least a couple of months. It was one of the more reliable trades you can kind of have on out there in the futures option space for a while before it finally uh, dissipated. So that, that, was, that, was a, that was a popular one. Yeah, that was a good one. And we, we saw that. We, saw, uh, at, we put it on at the highs, and it came back down where it looked like it might be normalizing again. Then we got another scare, and it went back up. So we saw, we saw a gain, then we saw a loss, then we saw a gain again. So we, de we definitely got an idea of how how to trade that and you know levels to uh, to maybe get out. So uh, yeah, so that I don't know that we're quite there yet, but yes, we are seeing that sort of separation from the calls and the puts. And uh, again, you know the weather in the Midwest is kind of crummy, a lot of rain coming up this next week, so that may affect it as well. But uh, you know, though June, July, and August and September, those are the old crop contracts. Uh, the the November will be a little bit separated from it because it's the new crop. So all the that, that'll start the the harvest of uh, uh, of the last planting. So um, so so yeah, your observations are exactly correct. You know, just by looking again, I'm just looking at the numbers, not being a, an agricultural specialist myself, but looking at the numbers, that's definitely happening. And uh, and like Mark said, we get a nice distribution of, of, of trade throughout here. So there's some good liquidity. And one thing we haven't mentioned this week, and we've been, we generally mention it, you know, again, uh, for these contracts, like almost a 5% increase in the open interest. So we continue to see open interest increases across all the commodities and across all the products. And, um, you know, the indexes especially and uh, the, the crude, uh, the rates, of course, all that kind of thing. So if you're looking for a place to trade or looking for products to trade, the indexes, uh, you know, the, the commodities a, a, as well as uh, even the rates. I don't think we have a lot of retail rate people out there yet, but I think at some point uh, that might happen. That'd be interesting, reflecting quite a change in the in the marketplace when the rates are lighting it up uh, with the retail. So long, uh, long answer to your question there, Lily Pod, summarizing, yeah, you know, not quite, actually nowhere near really as favorable as it was back in that, what was it, May to June time frame of last year, right, Nick? That really was very juicy. You can see that for yourself if you're following along live on the TWIFO page, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. Go up to soybeans, click on any of the quick skew, 25-day quick skew numbers there. You'll see for yourself exactly what we're talking about. Meanwhile, though, it's time to get on with the rest of your questions. It's time for some futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, uh, welcome to the Futures Options Feedback. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where you guys take the reins with your questions, your comments, uh, as well as our thoughts on your questions. We already snuck one in. Uh, we've got a lot more to sneak in here. Let's start things off with uh, Tommy. Tommy wants to know, he's, he's kind of weighing in with more of a comment on kind of our uh, ongoing discussion about all things WTI Weeklies. Uh, this is a question we've been asking ourselves and a lot of our guests on this program 
for many months now as to why exactly WTI trades the way it does. We see a lot of action in the front month. We see, and then we not really any appreciable action in the weeklies. Uh, Tommy chimes in saying, I think WTI weeklies struggle because producers are focused on the longer portion of the curve. Well, that, that's a, sent, a sentiment I think Blue expressed a similar, similar sentiment here. Blue Putnam, of course, excuse me, the chief economist over there at CME Group. He expressed a similar sentiment. I, I find that sentiment, there is some truth to that as a different use case, I think, for a different end user, really, for a lot of the WTI options products. So I think there is some truth to that. But I think the notion that the, all they do is play a year or two out, Nick, is kind of demonstrably false because the front month is where all the action is week after week. So if they were only playing a year or two or three years out, that's where we would see at least the lion's share of the paper. And we're just not seeing that. So the mystery, really, of WTI is, is why they will go a month and then no further. You know, this far and no further. I don't know, Nick. Do you, uh, I guess and I know how you feel on this one. But what do you, what do you think for what our friend Tommy has to say? I think, I think there's, it's a probably partially correct in, in that we see a lot of action out there in the June and the December contracts in the, in the deferred years, right? But like you said... Since the majority of the uh, of, of the volume tends to take place in the front month, you would think if people are really making plays, that they would look to make plays in the shorter term. Like I'm looking right now on uh, again, you can go to the expirations button on the Twifo report and turn everything off and just pull on the weeklies. And uh, there's a weekly uh, weekly contract that's got seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. Right. So and uh, so you would think, okay, we're going to see some action in there. And then the the June contract has. Uh, 27 days about so if there's especially you know what what doesn't make a lot of sense to me is you get these short-term burst moves so the options really that make sense in the short-term gamma moves are the are the weekly the short dated options right so why not trade those instead of the instead of the june contract i think it's still a matter of 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 liquidity for people and uh and once those markets start to be a little bit more representative of good liquidity on the on the electronic platform it's it's going to happen because it just doesn't if you're tri right why not if you want to capture a, a short term if you want to capture a meeting why not do the shortest expiration that you can get because now you're now that all of that event volatility is in that contract and you don't have to worry about all the other extra stuff that's another weird part about it we've been in these environments now where it's uniquely suited for weeklies. Look at leading into the OPEC event in November. That was a that was tailor-made for trading in weeklies. And pretty much every other week, we have some type of event that you'd think would be tailor-made for driving driving volume in the weeklies, yet we haven't seen it. I, I think you're right there, Nick, about the, the lack of liquidity. You know, liquidity does often beget liquidity. Even in a liquid product like WTI, sometimes not all the months, uh, the market makers, liquidity providers, whatever the case is, haven't really committed to them fully yet, so they're still a little wider than maybe they should be. And that, obviously, if it's going to have to wait until we see some more paper coming in, it's hard to see the paper when the markets are wide. So it's kind of the, the catch-22 of any kind of new or introductory product where they have to do that, that song and dance. Uh, and hopefully we'll see it settle out soon because th there are so many events. We talk about WTI every week. Clearly there is weekly activity in WTI, and yet for whatever reason it has not accreted yet to that really, really short por uh, portion of the curve. Good Good comment there, Tommy. You just like to, I think he's wanted to twist the knife, Nick, and just get us debating WTI weeklies again, because he knows we can go on about that for a while. All right, here's one for you, Nick. This is a question from Neil. Uh, Avere, maybe. If I, if I mispronounce that, I apologize. Uh, he asks, can you run down the quick skew again? I'm still not really sure how to read it. You kind of did this a little bit, Nick, last week. I think he must be looking at the live report or some of the other ones where he can see kind of the 25-day quick skew. I, I can maybe see why he's a little confused. You first see that for the first time. You see those numbers there, and you're like, 9.3P, 57C. What is that? So uh, really quickly for our listeners here again, uh, how do they read this? Especially if they're looking at the live report right now. How, how do they read that? Okay, so that's a that's a great question. I'm always glad to explain that because we were actually talking about that in the meeting uh, on Wednesday uh, with the guys that generate these reports for us. And um, when you look at, you know, if you look at the risk reversal, right, all you're getting is the separation between the call and the put. You don't really get any relative value to each other, right? And if you look at the butterfly, 25 delta butterfly, you're really seeing um, – a number that tells you whether the the wings are rich or cheap to that the money now but that could easily be uh, a call that's you know nine vol higher than that the money and a put that's nine vol lower and it ends up showing a zero so you think no the wings aren't rich or cheap to the at the money that's flat but what the quick skew does and again like mark said 
we put the puts first and then the call second. And why do we put the puts first? Because the left side of the vol curve, when you're looking at the screen, is the put side, okay? So you see that number, and it says, for instance, I'm looking at the crude June report right now. It says 5.6 capital P. So we put the capital to represent that it's rich, so it's tall, it's bigger than the other one, right? So it's 5.6% richer than the at the money. So if the vol is uh, 100 at the at the money, the put vol is five, 105 points. It's now, now that's, I shouldn't say that. Let's say if the vol is 10 at the money, the, the, um, the put volatility is 10.56, okay? It's 5% of the at the money more in volatility. And then the same thing goes for the other side. If you see, uh, in this case, you have almost a 2.0, a 2 point, oh, it's 1.9 small c. So that means the calls are cheap to the at the money. So they're, so you multiply the at the money volatility times the percent that's represented in the quick skew. So in this case, 1.9%. So you'd get the, the calls are trading just below 10%. Okay. So the idea is, so now looking at that, if you click on that screen and then you look at all of the quick skew history, what you can tell very simply from that chart is uh, you can tell whether the call or the put was rich or cheap to add the money. You can also tell distinctly what the shape of the curve looks like. So if you have a, if you have a rich call and a cheap put, then you know that the call side of the curve is above the at the money and the put side of the curve is below the at the money if you if you see both of them at the at, at the center line then you know that it's a that both of them are trading at the same volatility as the at the money so the idea is capital capital p or c is rich small p or c is cheap so one trading above one's trading below there you go Hope you got. I think that's not the last question we're going to get on that, Nick. But it's good. That's good. They're good. They're seeing. That means they're looking at it and uh, they're playing around with it. And they too want to uh, want to learn what's up with that. I, the gold bugs are listening, to Nick. Just trading. Just uh, just tweeted to us. All he said was got gold and got silver. Hashtag. Got. So I get clearly maybe he's the one buying those seventeen hundred calls. What do you think out there in DC? I knew. I know. Whenever I invoke the gold bugs, they 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 surface. They're out there. Uh, so clearly, clearly listening over there today. I love that. All right, uh, let's go. Let's wrap up with this one here. It's more of a comment from Stal Stallion Stallion. He wants to. So he wants to say here. Uh, why is there so much concern about low crude volatility? Uh, we're just in a new volatility regime for crude right now. Just because crude vol is low doesn't mean that selling it isn't a winning trade. We're seeing the same thing in broad equity volatility right now. Well, he's, he's totally right. We have said that. You know, just we're, I think people, people are more writing into us saying, where is the crude vol more than us saying, why, wringing our hands saying, why is there no crude vol? It's more, I think, responding to you guys than to anything else. Uh, but you're right. You're totally right. This is, we are probably in a new crude regime. It seems like there definitely was an inflection point back in that November OPEC meeting. We certainly saw the skew shift. Uh, as, as we also saw the at the money implied volatility regime shift as a result. And now we're in a lower regime. And it's going to take something, some sort of systemic move or change to get us back either into that higher inflated regime or maybe even into a lower regime. But you're right. Right now, we haven't, last week or two notwithstanding, in that one move about a month ago, we haven't seen a lot of, of volatility out there in crude. So you're right. It has been, even though it's low, it has been a, a winning trade. It's kind of like analogous to what we're seeing out here in the broad equity volatility right now. Look at the post-France election. They annihilated volatility in the S&Ps this week. Uh, so the, and a lot of people may think it was overdone. Uh, maybe it was a little bit too aggressive. Uh, but that said, uh, is, so being short volatility was a winning trade out there as well, even though overall implied volatility levels and realized volatility levels were still very low. Still selling it was a winning trade. That's a little bit of a counterintuitive thing for people sometimes I think they wrap their heads around, Nick. We talked about this on our, I know, on our Volatility Views program before, and it gets a lot of a pushback whenever we do that concept of sometimes when vol is low is when you want to sell it. Sometimes when vol is really high, that may be where you want to buy it because that's when it has a tendency to outperform on the upside and continue outperforming, whereas on the low end, it has a tendency to kind of sit there, maybe even get lower. So it's counterintuitive to a lot of people, but uh, sometimes that is the case. I agree with you here, Stalin, that I think that's what we're in the regime we're in right now, at least for the foreseeable future out here in uh, in WTI. Mr. Nick, do you agree you're going to take a point counterpoint with me and have a nice, vicious debate? No, I, I think that we've been saying all along that just because it's low doesn't mean you can't sell it, right? We talked about, and I think the perfect example is when we talk about the high open interest uh, strikes that basically represent a short strangle, right? So you, we 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 tell we tell you all the time about what we think about what well, what we know just by looking at the charts, what the high open interest put and high open interest call, and we've pretty readily traded between those for the last I don't know, 
four or five, six months, pretty much. And, you know, we, we, we had a period of time until we went below the 50, right? We had that, we were kind of above 50 to 55. And then we, 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 we had the 45 to 55 range, right? We used to slap ourselves for saying, well, that's such a wide range. But the reality is we traded within that range. We didn't really see much volatility, you know, spike or decline, but, uh, and we talk about it as well from the vol term structure, right? For weeks, we've been talking about the June, July, September butterfly, right? So you can get short volatility by being short the July twice and by the June and by the September. And you have a short volatility play. You also have, you know, if the market does move, you get a you get a nice punch from the gamma on the June contract, but you don't lose too much from a from a volatility standpoint either because you're making up for that in any bid the June might get and the September is going to stay with the July for the most part. So, um, and again, we... And there's reasons why that July volatility is a little little bit of a hump, right? We talk about the next OPEC meeting coming in after the June contract expires. But but absolutely, some, you know, I think the more I look at the markets and the more I watch and the, over the years I traded where I tended to be biased towards um, liking to own gamma and, you know, being short volatility, that type of thing, I think that the markets show us that, you, you know, you, you don't, A, you don't really know what's going to happen, but it, you can put on you could put on a short strangle even on a low volatility environment and make money here and 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 or at least be willing to sit on it and you know try to catch some of that decay so uh not we're not that concerned it's just one thing we point out and talk about talk about the historical lows of it and watch it and see how the volatility reacts in a trend in a, in a range and how it's trending so that's the that's really what we're trying to point out here more than saying not to do something or or to do something from a volatility standpoint All right, Mr. Nick, that music means we've come up against it yet again. Fun show this week. Mixed in some extra stuff. We didn't really, uh, I, don't, I didn't plan on talking soybeans today, but the listeners spoke and uh, they got it, which is, uh, that's what we like you guys. We like you guys. You guys tune us on and tune us into products maybe that aren't on our collective radar. They throw that, what are they throwing that for? Fluid milk, lean hogs. You guys get all the esoteric products. Soybeans actually more mainstream than what you usually ask us about. So that was a comparatively easy one. Keep those questions coming. We do love to hear from you guys. And again, you guys can always follow along with all these reports we talk about throughout the week at cmegroup.com slash twifo. That's where these reports are live. The links are only live during showtime. Uh, but the reports are live all week long, so you can keep generating them. So you want to see exactly the week up to that point. Let's say you check them on Tuesday or Wednesday. You want to see what's going on so far that week in WTI or fluid milk, whatever your product of choice is. Head on over there. You can do just that all completely free. Kick the tires and light the fires, as they like to say. And then, of course, on Friday, every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, you can join Mr. Nick and I for a nice deep dive into all things, uh, all things, all things Twifo, all things hot futures options over here. And while you're over there on CME site, make sure you check out uh, their newly revamped, newly revised CME Institute, formerly the Futures Institute. Last time they were on, they were talking a lot about that. But you guys are always asking us, is, is there good futures options education over there? Well, they got you covered over there. Now, it's actually quite a bit of it over there. Uh, that's why they, hence the rebranding. Futures Institute didn't really imply a lot of options education, so now they got you covered. Head on over there. It's all free, so uh, so what are you waiting for? Head on over there to CME Group. Check out the CME Group Institute to learn a little more about what we're talking about here on this fun show. So any, any of the terms are above your head or you're confused, hit them up over there, and I'm sure they got you covered. And speaking of us covered, Mr. Nick, you got live reports going on for us this week. You got live links. What else is cooking in the land of Quick Strike this week, sir? Uh, well, that was, uh, that was a big one that we've been waiting to get out there. So I, I took a look, and we saw some activity out there. So hopefully in, in the weeks to come, as people learn, we'll get more live listeners and more people participating actually online. Uh, as far as anything else goes, we'll be, we have some reports that are sort of getting vetted, but we'll have some good uh, uh, quick skew, rich, cheap, historical stuff that you can look at the whole benchmark uh, of, of products at the CME Group and look and see what looks rich, what, look rich, what looks cheap. Also, ranking of uh, the puts and calls by the quick skew so you can see if there's a rich or cheap put or call and it'll show you across all the expirations in the product what's rich or cheap. And then we're also going to have, which one I uh, one I really like is a DTE, sort of a seasonal report, depending on how you look at it. And it'll show you, if, for instance, if something's got 34 days to expiration, it's going to show you uh, the contract last year at this time that they had 34 days in the year prior and the year prior. So you see, for instance, in in, in crude, as an example, 27 days to expiration today, you can go back and look at what, what the June contract looked like last year, the year before that, year before that, all 
uh, at that day's expiration and see what it looked like a week before, a week after, so you can kind of start to get some trends, see how things might trade. There you go. Check them out over there. Uh, pretty much anywhere you can get it, cmegroup.com. All the tools are there. Or just search for Quick Strike. Remember, there's no C. It's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E. If you want to follow them on Twitter, it's Q-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. And you can get all those cool charts. And he says you can tweet out now directly from the system. So you like, a lot of you guys like those cool charts. More of them coming from Nick and his team if you follow them over there on Twitter. And on behalf of Nick and our friends over there at CME Group and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing. Of course, for all of you can join us live. We love you guys, too, as well as everybody who listens after the fact. We haven't forgotten about you guys. Don't worry. And we'll see you next time for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.